But we're going to try to look at this a little differently uh, during this last portion about where the most strength is, where some of the deficits are, as a way of padding out and understanding what needs to be done. So a bit of a more practical, pragmatic approach to uh, getting this more mature uh, as fast as possible and make it most uh, usable and um, applicable and beneficial to enterprises. So with that, um, you're familiar with the panel, um, but I'll go through them anyway, just for the sake of uh, for the, anyone that may have come in late. Uh, we're joined by uh, Michael Fulton, he's principal architect at CC and C Solutions. Philippe Genest, and a partner in Accenture. Sue Desiderio, the director of Price Warehouse, a director at Price Warehouse Coopers. Dwight David, enterprise architect, Hewlett Packard Enterprise, and Rob Akershok, solution architect, IT for IT at Shell IT International. <clears throat> So let me uh, start with our panel and just go down the line. Um, Philippe, tell me where you think the most progress has been made in terms of making this a mature reference architecture and where you think the most work is needed, at least from your slice and view on these. Most, uh, okay, greatest level of maturity, I think. Hmm. That's a tough one. <laughs> I think I like the well the two innovations that we have in the in the IT for IT reference architecture the service uh, backbone and the R2F. I think we keep hammering on this message, but I think it's important for people to understand that that these are the two greatest novelties of the reference architecture. Are they mature? I think they are mature enough. <laughs> They'll probably evolve in their level of maturity. There are a number of areas that are maturing, uh, and some that we have in design. The IT financial management, for instance, is one that, again, I'm, I'm working on a little bit, and the, uh, the service costing within that, which I think we'll get a chance to get ready by version 2.1, and the idea is to have it as guidance into version 2.1. Um, so the, the, the value streams by themselves, I think, are uh, also mature and almost complete. There are a number of improvements we can make to all of them, but I think the overall the reference architecture is usable today as an architecture to start with. Not quite for vendor certification, although that's upcoming. Uh, but there are a number of good things and a number of implementations that would benefit from using, using the current it for it reference architecture version 2.0. Sue, uh, also, where do you see the most uh, traction and um, growth, and what would you like to see improved? Um, I would say that I would agree with Philippe's statements. Um, I would say, and also even picking up on what Lars had said earlier this morning, I, I do think it is an easier entry point to start with Detect to Correct, which is often where we see it because it's a maybe one of the value streams that's a little bit more known and understood, and so that's an easier point of entry um, for the whole IT for IT value chain um, compared to some of the other value streams. I think um, the service model is definitely, as we've stated all along, um, the backbone to the whole IT value chain, and although I think it is well-formed and in a good mature state, I think there's still plenty of work to do to really make that consumable to the IT organizations to really understand all the different um, phases of the life cycle, all of the different data objects that make up the service backbone, and so that is something that we are currently working on um, for the 2.1 version so that we have better examples, we can really show how it applies in a real IT organization, and it's not just what's in the documentation today. And uh, same to you, positive and negative? Um, well, I don't think it's about positive and negative in, in this case, but it's like some areas where we need to work on specifically is like the, the service broker role that you see in the IT organization. So interfacing with your suppliers. So uh, we have identified a number of areas where you, where you have touch point with the vendors, like uh, if you have your catalog, you need to synchronize catalog information with the external vendors and aggregating it in your own catalog, but also the fulfillment API of how do you communicate a request to your suppliers or different technology stacks and getting the consumption and cost data in. So that's an area that I think we define that, but we need to go to a lower level of detail is how do we actually integrate with the vendors and uh, our, our service providers, I must say. So there's on many different levels. It's on the catalog level, the request fulfillment that you actually do provision, CMDB, the cost consumption data, 
uh, and uh, all those kind of level. And another topic I think is still the linking into security and identity access management. It's an area where we still need to clearly identify, you have a, an identity in your IT organization that has a subscription to a service. So the linking into that access management uh, capability, mm -hmm. which is part of the subscription and, and of course the fulfillment. We don't, didn't identify it as a separate functional component. Uh, and Dwight, where are you most optimistic and where would you put more emphasis? Oh, I'll start with the, the latter. I think more emphasis needs to be really our approach to specifically to detect cor to correct. Um, oftentimes I, I see people thinking about detect to correct as really in the traditional mode of being reactive, as really as opposed to really understanding that this model can be applied even to the new changing um, you know, user-friendly type of economy and within, you know, the hybrid type of IT. So I, I think really a change in thinking in the application of the value streams really would also help us. I think many of us have a lot of gray hairs, including myself, um, so we revert to the old way of thinking as opposed to the way we should be moving forward. So that's really, I, I think, the area that we can, we can, we can do the most. Um, what I think is, is really good, though, is that a lot of people understand detect to correct. So it's an easy adoption in terms of understanding the reference architecture. It's a good entry point to the IT for IT reference architecture. So that's where I see the, the actual benefit. And I would also, again, encourage us to actually make it useful, use it, try it. The most benefit happens then. And Michael, same, uh, room for optimism and room for improvement. Yeah, I, I want to build on, on Dwight's point around trying it uh, by sharing the, the one thing I'm most excited about, particularly this week, uh, and that's the, the management guide. Um, the, the, and particularly, very specifically, chapter five of the management guide. I hope all of you got a chance to, to grab your copy of that. If you haven't, I recommend downloading it. Uh, from the Open Group website. That chapter is just absolutely rich in content about how to actually implement IT for IT. And I, I tip my hat to Rob, who did a, a great piece of work along with several other people. Uh, but it's just, if, if you want to pick up this standard and use it, start there. Start with chapter five of the management guide and uh, you may not need to go much further because that's just great content to, to work with. So I'm very excited about that. Um, from a standpoint of, of where we need to continue to evolve and grow as a standard, um, we've, we've referenced uh, some of the individual pieces, um, but at a higher level, I think the supporting activities in general uh, really all still need to, to evolve and, and get to the level of detail that we have with the value streams. Uh, so that's a key area for me. And then the next area, that I would highlight, and I know we're actively starting work on this, is is really around uh, getting down to that level of detail where we can do data interoperability, uh, where we can start to outline the specifics that are needed to um, to define APIs between the functional components in such a way that we can ultimately really uh, bring us back to that open group vision of boundaryless information flow. Hmm. And picking up on that, um, when we finished our main um, panel in the plenary this morning, just before lunch, one of the last points made was how do we bridge the divide between a cloud provider or a series of providers and uh, have IT in a brokering role within the organization, but as the broker, they're going to be held responsible for the performance regardless of where those services uh, originate and how they interoperate or not. So what do we see as needed in order to make that boundarylessness extend to this idea of uh, a brokered IT organization, a hybrid organization, but still able to produce a common approach to support and um, uh, quality of service across IT uh, in that particular organization. So again, let's start on one end of the panel and work our way along. How do we get to that hybrid vision, um, Philippe? I think we'll, we'll get there step by step. The, I, I think there's a practical step that's implementable already today. Uh, my suggestion would be that every customer company that, that selects an outsourcer, that selects a cloud vendor, that selects a product, uses the IT for IT reference architecture in the RFP. 
putting a, a strong emphasis on the integration. You know, we, we, we see a lot of RFPs that are silo-based still. Uh, which one is the best product for uh, pro um, sorry, uh, project and portfolio management? Which one is the best service management tool? But, but very, it's not very frequent that we see the integration as, as being the top-notch value in, uh, measured in the RFP. Uh, so that would be one point. The discussions with uh, vendors, again, cloud vendors or outsourcers uh, or consulting firms should be, um, you know, start from this, use it as a, an integration architecture and, and, you know, tell us how you would do things based on these, uh, on these standardized concepts. So today that's a, a practical step that can be um, used or, or, or employed. Uh, I think in a, in a second step, when we go forward to or further into the, uh, the vendor uh, specification, there are vendors today, or again, when you analyze the products and the cloud offerings that are closer to the concepts we have in the reference architecture. Maybe not certified, maybe not uh, you know the same terminology, but the concepts are there, or the way to the concepts is, is closer. And then ultimately, yeah, step three and three and a half will be product vendor certified, cloud service offering certified, um, and hopefully, so full integration according to the RA, and eventually even plug and play. Uh, mm -hmm. Maybe I'm dreaming a little bit about plug and play, but at and least integration. And what sort of time frame would you put on those steps? Is this a two-year process, a four-year process? Too soon to tell? Um, uh -huh. <laughs> That's a tough one. Uh, I suppose the vendors should be responding to this one. But the uh, no, I think for the for the service providers, for the uh, well, for the cloud service providers, it's a little bit trickier. But for the for the consulting firm, for the service providers, it should be what it takes to get the workforce trained. Um, and to get the concepts spread inside the organization. So I would say within six to 12 months, the, the critical mass should be there in these organizations. It's possible stuff, but project by project, customer by customer, it's achievable. Uh, vendors, I know some are on the way, and we've, we've seen several vendors talk about IT for IT in, in this venue, in this conference. Uh, so I'm pretty sure that those have, you know, I know that those have uh, significant efforts on the way and, and are prepared preparing for vendor certification, and it will be probably a multi-year process to get the full suite of products certified because there's quite a lot to change in the underlying software, mm -hmm. uh, but progressively we, we should get there. So having first levels of certification within, I don't know, one to two years, possibly even sooner, and be interested in knowing what the vendor responses will be. Mm -hmm. uh, Sue, along the same lines, what do you see needed in order to make the IT department able to exercise the responsibility of delivering IT across uh, multiple players and multiple boundaries. Yeah, again, I think it's starting with the awareness and the open communication about IT for IT and on a specific instance, where does that fit in? So depending on the services we're getting from vendors from um, whether it be um, even internal services that we're getting or across, really where do they fit into the whole IT for IT framework? Um, what functions are we getting? What are those key components within that? And you know, kind of where our interface points are and really have those conversations up front in the contract conversations and whatnot so that it's, you know, everyone's aware of what we're really trying to accomplish and that we really are trying to seek that seamless um, integration between, you know, ourselves and those suppliers. Mm -hmm. uh, Rob, this would appear to be a buyer's market in terms of their ability to exercise some influence if they go seeking RFPs, if there are a fewer uh, cloud providers than there were general vendors in a, a traditional IT environment, uh, they should be able to dictate this, don't you think? Uh, you mean who dictates it? I would well, in, in the cloud world, I would say the consumer would not dictate at all. See, that's the traditional way that we dictate how an op operator should provide us data. So that's the problem with the cloud. We want a consumer standard service. So in that sense, we cannot tell the cloud vendor, you sent me your cost data in this format, right? That will not work because we don't want the cloud vendor to make something proprietary for us. So, so that's the first challenge. The cloud vendors are out there and we don't want to dictate. We're going to assume a standard service. So if they set up a catalog in their way, we have to adopt that. If they do the billing on their way, we have to adopt it or select another cloud vendor. So that's the only option you have. Select another vendor or 
uh, yeah, adopt the management practices of the cloud vendor. Um, because otherwise we will continuously uh, update, uh, have to update it according to, the, to our policy. So, so that's a key challenge. So that's why managing your cloud vendors is really about the entire value, value chain. So you start with strategy to portfolio, thinking about what cloud services do I put in my uh, offerings, or my portfolio, I must say. So defining, let's say, for past platforms, we use vendor A, and for infrastructure as a service, vendor B. And so that's where it starts. Eh? Which vendors do I engage with? Um, and then going down to the request to fulfill, it's more like, okay, what are the products that we allow to order, and how do we provision those? And unfortunately, the cloud vendors, they don't have IT for IT yet, meaning we have to do some work, let's say, uh, the same is how IT for IT defines it. Let's say we want to provision a cloud environment. We make sure that all the cloud resources we provision are linked to that s subscription, linked to that service, so at least we know the, the components that the cloud vendor is managing, where it belongs to, and which service is consuming that. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm going to jump in on, on Dwight. I apologize, Dwight. But uh, to, to Rob's point, I think Rob is, has got a key point here around uh, the expectations uh, being different around cloud vendors. And, and that's why I think IT for IT is actually so powerful. Uh, a cloud vendor is, is not going to customize their interfaces for every single individual company. But we can hold cloud vendors accountable to an open industry standard like IT for IT if we've detailed out the right levels of interoperability. And so to me, that's the, the way that this thing comes together long term is, is through this open standard and then through that RFP process, hold customer organizations holding their vendors accountable to delivering against that, that open standard. And I think in the world of cloud, I think that's actually to the benefit of the, uh, the cloud providers as well. Yeah, I think that's a key point you make there, indeed. Yeah. And even just to, to piggyback on, on what you're saying, it goes back to the value proposition. Why am I doing this, right? And if we have something that's an open standard, it enables velocity, it, you can identify costs much easier, it's simpler, so really it goes back again to the value proposition and showing really these cloud vendors that because of a standard, I am able to consume more of your service, I'm able to consume your service easier, and here I'm guaranteed, based on, because it's a standard, to you know, get my value. So again, back to the value proposition, which the open standard offers. Great. A couple of other threads that we heard earlier today were the idea that this standard makes more sense, at least now, for large organizations than, say, startups or SMBs, and that automation is essential and that manual processes are a bug. Um, <clears throat> how do we uh, react to that? Is that uh, wisdom and truth for you that automation is king and that this is designed for large complex organizations uh, again we'll start on one side with uh, Philippe it, it, it will be sorry it will, it will be a lot uh, it will take more work for a large, a large organization to deploy the full RA than it will be for a smaller organization I think the, those organizations that Today, use a lot of um, uh, DevOps practices, agile practices that are close to the concepts that we have, service catalogs, service backbone, should be able to get it straight very quickly, as a matter of fact, including with, uh, you know, with uh, product, vendor products and, and things that aren't necessarily fully certified, but at least for which the concepts are quite close to what we're recommending here. Um, so the large organizations will have a different uh, set of challenges, which is that there is a massive legacy that we need to transform along the concepts. Uh, so it's possible, and, and you know, we heard recommendations. Start with B2C or or do it, you know, one way or another. But the, the I would say the 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 smaller organizations can get it right by simplifying some of the implementations 
um, getting the right tools, they can move faster on two new tools. Um, and, and you know, I view it as two different challenges, but not necessarily inadapted for, for the smaller organizations. It's a set of very good practices that are implementable, um, and the description is in the, is in the books, basically, that, that have just been published. Um, the, the ones for which I see an extra challenge, perhaps, uh, or at least that I see today in the industry, is the big outsourcers. You know, those long-term contracts, data center outsourcing, five years, um, network, so on and so forth. Um, companies that use those uh, should plan before their contract renegotiation, exactly what I said for the RFPs for, you know, vendor products. When you are planning a year ahead, two years ahead, even three years ahead to renegotiate your outsourcing contracts, Again, introduce the, uh, the, the the reference architecture, use it as a, a bit of a benchmark for, for who you're going to contract with. And if you know that you're going to renegotiate with the same vendor, try and influence them enough that they can, you know, you can have these concepts and these, uh, these architectures in place. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Sue, how about this issue of automation? Is it essential to be largely automated to realize the full benefits of IT for IT, or is that more of a nice to have? or a goal? How, what's the relationship between a high degree of automation in your IT organization for uh, the support of these activities and the standard and reference architecture? Yeah, I, I definitely am a believer that automation is key, so we definitely have to get automation throughout the whole end-to-end -end value chain no, no matter what. That's really um, part of the whole transformation um, going into this new model. Um, so, so yeah, I, I think you see that actually throughout the whole um, value chain. I mean, we talked about it, I think, individually on the different value streams um, and how it comes back. I, I also want to touch back on, you know, what's the right size uh, company or firm to actually pick up the IT for IT. And, and I do agree with where Philip was coming from, is that I think your smaller shops can actually pick it up and start leveraging it more quickly because they don't have that legacy and all that historical legacy IT that was done, you know, where it's very, you know, not built on composite services and things, but everything, you know, on an, a system is, you know, pinpointing direct servers and direct networks and all this, instead of the building it on services like a hosting service and a monitoring response service. So for your larger IT organizations, um, you know, there's a lot more change, but it's critical for us to really survive and actually be viable in the future um, for those IT shops, the larger ones and larger organizations to really start adopting and moving forward. Um, and, and it's not a big bang. We on a, on a larger IT shop are going to be running in a mixed mode for a large time to come or long time to come. So it's really looking at where do you start really seeing that that business value, and as you look at um, new initiatives and things within your organization, how do you start moving into the new model with the new things? How do you start transitioning your legacy systems and whatnot into more of the new way of thinking and really looking at that consumption model and what we're really trying to do, which is focus on that business outcome. So it's much harder for the larger IT shops, I would say, um, but I do think the concepts apply to all sizes. Mm -hmm. Rob, the uh, subject of the moment is size and automation. Yeah, I think the principle we just discussed, automation is, we automate always, is the, it's a good principle. Uh, but if you look at the legacy, as you, as you mentioned, so you're not going to automate your legacy in, in, unless you have a real good business case for that. But So you need to standardize your services on many different layers, and that's what you see in the clouds. Cloud vendors are standardizing extremely. Say, these are my standard components, and you have to do the same. You say, these are our standard services, and we're going to automate those. And the rest, the legacy ones, is yeah, you cannot automate, or you, do, you probably don't want to automate those. So, the, so you, it's more standardization, more uh, standard configurations, and then you can automate. Uh, and that's valid for detect correct as well. If you have a very complex configurations and it changes all the time without any standard, so, and if even if you're small, uh, let's say you 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 deploy to the cloud there. Because typically, if you're smaller, you probably consume more from the cloud. There, you still use their automation tools, right? You, you, and it can be done initially through a web portal. To, uh, it could be the Amazon or Azure. But you could also have then to standardize like infrastructure as code there. So as a developer, you're going to do that. So it doesn't have to be small or a large organization. Uh, it's even for small environments, you can do that. And you probably should to make it uh, mm -hmm. uh, repeatable. Yeah. 
Yes. So small organizations don't want to remain small all the time. They actually want to grow. So it starts really, growth starts with a, a mindset, a thinking mindset. By applying the reference architecture, even though you don't apply every single point to my one man or two man shop, it then helps me, it positions me, it gives me the frame of reference, the thinking to enable growth, and so it grows organically. So you don't end up with the, you know, the legacy baggage that most of the large companies have. And small companies may get acquired, right? At least they have good discipline, or they may acquire others as they grow. So I think the application of the reference architecture, IT for IT, is just not for large companies. It's also for small companies, and I'm saying that as a small business owner myself. Can I add to that? Uh that if you are starting now as a cl to the cloud, deploy to the cloud, maybe the best way is to start with automation at the first, or at least design for automation. Because if once you have a few thousand servers running in the cloud and you didn't start with that concept to start off, then you already have legacy after a few years running in the cloud. So you, you, you should start thinking about automation from the start. Mm. And not with your legacy, of course, but if you're now moving to the cloud, design that as, uh, and build that immediately on the on the control let's say yeah on this uh, on this topic of size um, you may if you if you were with us yesterday you might have participated in a maturity model conversation if you were here this morning for Ryan's uh, plenary speech uh, he referenced uh, an emergence model uh, we have just started work within the forum uh, on this topic, and I think there's a, a, at a minimum a few of us, and, and I think um, potentially one of the directions we're heading is to figure out this very issue. What of the reference architecture applies at what size and evolution in a company's growth? And I think that as I mentioned, uh, I think I made this comment earlier, I actually think that the entire reference architecture applies from day one for companies of any size. It's just a question of whether it is explicit or implicit. If it's, if it's implicit, it's in the head of the founder. You're still doing the, the elements, or you can be still doing the elements of the reference architecture in your mindset and your thought process and your thinking. But there are pieces you need to make explicit, even when you're in, uh, as, as Charlie likes to say, two people in a garage. Um, on, the, on the cloud piece, I think, or, or I'm sorry, the automation piece, the, the key thing I would say that um, has been happening uh, throughout our industry related to automation has been, at least this is my perspective, when we've been automating, we've been automating within functional components. And I think what the, the IT for IT reference architecture and its vision of value streams allows us to do is rethink automation along the lines of value streams uh, across functional components. And that's where I think it starts to really add considerable value, especially when we can start to put together interoperability um, between tooling on some of these things. I think that's where we're going to see automation really take us to that ne next level as IT organizations. <coughs> Okay, one more question from me before we'll take some questions from the audience. And this goes a little bit into the future, a little bit of the hypothetical. But <clears throat> as IT for IT matures and becomes adopted and serves both consumers and providers of services, it seems to me that there'll be a similar track with digital business of how you run your business, which is going to be more a brokering activity at a business level. That a business is, is really a, a constituency of different providers across supply chain, increasingly across service providers. Is there a dual track for IT for IT in the IT side and business for business uh, management of services through portal, through dashboard, something that your business analyst and on up would be involved with. Should we let them happen separately? How can we make them more aligned and even perhaps uh, uh, highly integrated and, and synergistic? Um, so I hope you understand where I'm getting at. Again, we'll start on the panel and with Philippe. All right. I'll 
Well, I'm, I'm, I'm looking at your question as, uh, you know, we have such best practices in IT for IT that the businesses themselves who can replicate that and, and, and use that for themselves, basically. So if I'm a, well, I suppose certain companies do that a little bit today, if you take the Ubers and the, you know, some of the Airbnbs and, and, and have these uh, uh, disintermediation, um, connecting with, uh, well, private individuals a lot of the time, but have, have some of these uh, service-oriented concepts today, effectively, even even though they don't use IT for IT. Uh, but I think that just as much as we see today, we have cases where um, businesses for their uh, help desks or for their um, yeah, request management, basically, turn to uh, the likes of HPE for uh, you know uh, service management software to help them with their business help desk. We are likely effectively to see that those best practices in terms of uh, uh, individualization and specification of individual conceptual service, service catalog, subscription mechanisms, you're right, the concepts could very easily apply to businesses. How technically that would turn out, uh, we need to do a little bit more thinking, but I think from a concept standpoint, it surely should be useful. Sue? Yeah, I mean, again, I mean, I, I think we really are trying to move ourselves up the stack to really be helping the businesses in the services that they are providing. And so it's very relevant as we're looking at IT for IT and how we're managing, you know, the IT services. It's also those business services. And I think it's concurrent. I mean, I think it's really evolving and, and really, you know, make training and making the business aware of where we're trying to go and how can they leverage that in their own services that they're providing outward. And I mean, when you look at adopting this, even even you go back down to your IT um, in your organization where you have your different, you know, typical organizational teams and things like that, it's, you know, there's a challenge for each IT team to really look at what are the services they're providing and how do they start looking at what they do in terms of services instead of just the functions. And so, I mean, that goes all the way up the stack, including the business and the business services and IT's job and really where we start talking about transformation is really being, you know, next to and aligned with the business so we really understand their business processes and the services that they're really trying to serve and then how are we truly that business enabler. So. Great, thank you. I, I interpret your question like we discussed, I think, this morning about shadow IT, that, that there is no shadow IT, then the IT is part of the, or performed, some management activities performed by the business. And, and I think yeah, you, you mentioned it as well, then it, they can apply IT for IT there as well. So as soon as uh, IT activities are done by the business, like they have their own SaaS application, they do it all themselves, they even configure it themselves, the business is doing the configuration, uh, they maybe even do end user support, they do end user support, then those activities fit in the IT for IT reference architecture model as well. Mm. Dwight, we have a business scorecard, we have an IT scorecard. Why shouldn't they be the same scorecard? Yeah, I'm always reminded that uh, IT is in place to help the business, right? The business is the function. IT should be an invisible enabler of business success. So I, I think in really IT for IT's, I would classify it even catching up really to, to business uh, today. Um, so could some of the principles that we apply in IT be used for the business? Yeah, it can be, but I see more of the other way around, right? If you look at our whole uh, value chain, that really came from the business perspective being approached, being applied to IT. So I still see that the business driving, but really IT becoming more seamless in enabling the business to achieve their, their particular goals. Michael? Yeah, I, th I think that um, the whole concept of digital business is actually a complete misnomer. I hate it. I, I, I think it's uh, I think it's wrong, and, and the reason why I think it is is wrong is because it, it's all about the application of information technology. I think in the context of what we typically talk about with IT for IT, we're talking about the application of information technology to the management of the IT departments, uh, 
But we also talk about the application of information technology to the transformation of business processes. Most of the time that happens inside companies, and we're, we're using the, the principles of IT for IT to do that. When we talk about digital business, usually we're talking about the application of information technology into the transformation of business models of companies. And again, it's still all about applying information technology to make the company work in a different way. And for me, the IT for IT principles, the reference architecture, the value streams, I'll still hold for all of that. Well, great. Uh, we have time for one or two questions from our audience. And um, let's start with the gentleman right there in the black shirt. So I heard that you could start with the tech to correct the a comment was made that you could start with detect to correct as an entry point into the value chain. And then I also heard you don't have to implement all the functional components. Does that imply that you can do just some of the value streams and not all, and people can kind of pick and choose what they think will help their organization the most? I would say the, the starting point can be detect to correct, but I think as Sue mentioned earlier, it's where in your business is that pain point. Evaluate the entire value chain, look at all the value streams, map that to your business activity, identify where you have exactly a, you know one of your main pain points, and start there. Certainly, if we go to uh, detect to correct, and maybe your shop doesn't have a problem. Uh, type of practice, there are certainly options that you can maybe leave out problem if that's not a particular pain point for you. Again, the size of the company, the level of maturity will determine where you actually start and what you use. But what we do have in the reference architecture, it will help any size of company across the breadth of that in, that particular organization to use and apply the architecture. So, so I, yeah, my, my opinion is that you don't start with a specific value stream because otherwise you focus too much on a single value stream. So you still look at the overall picture first. So even if you have, you, you're going to optimize detect to correct, it doesn't make sense if you don't have requirements to deploy very well or you even don't have your service portfolio in order. So in that sense, you should not try to optimize a value stream by, by itself. Um, and, and I guess, most organizations have something in place, and then you could say, yeah, I have my portfolio, my service portfolios. So if you don't have anything, you probably start with strategy to portfolio. What services do we start to offer, right? You don't, you, you don't have suddenly so many services running out there. So that's best, as always, to start there. But of course, we're not in a green field. So you hope that you have some portfolio management capabilities in place. If not, maybe that's, at least you need to start there, because otherwise you seem to be you cannot link your CIs to services, you have no concept of that. So you, you, I think it's still you look at the entire uh, value chain, you select the things that you try to mature. Um, what, right? one, one suggestion on this, I think, which we're uh, testing at the moment with, uh, with a couple of clients is the start with a pass. Start with the platform as a service thing. So to train your, your, your IT workforce, First, they need to understand all these concepts before they move it to the business. Um, and, and IT, you know, will source its own services. Uh, my, my development environment, my, my test. I'm sorry, my development service, my test service, and so on. And once you've piloted that, then move on to everything that you develop in the what we call the new. Uh, all of the, all of those uh, digital solutions or solutions for the digital business, uh, which typically are yeah, newer, based on 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 these metaphors, and have uh, tools that are easier to make work uh, along those concepts. And then progressively, as as these will not work in isolation, they will need to work with your some of your legacy, some of the data you have in your existing uh, you know data sources and so on. Uh, you can bring those on as as um, designing them as services as as standard standardized APIs and progressively bring in the uh, you know more and more business services in that in that fashion and and sort of try and take over the the legacy of the IT progressively like this. Mm -hmm. well, I'm afraid we've gone over our time a bit, so I think we'll have to leave it there. But how about a big hand for our panel? Thank you. <laughs>